Okay, well, uh, welcome everyone um, to another TCS Plus talk. Uh, we're really happy to have Christos Stamos here, um, who's going to tell us about a strongly polynomial time algorithm for approximate force to transform. And I guess before we get started, let me just mention that I want to encourage everybody to keep their cameras on, usually um, having some visual feedback for the speaker is uh, really nice. Um, and we're recording the talk, it'll be posted in our website, um, but there'll be um, a 15 minute kind of just hangout session at the end of the, uh, of, uh, of the talk, which will be unrecorded and we can just hang out. And then finally, I want to thank the rest of the organizers that uh, allows TCS Plus to happen. Um, this includes Clement Kanan, Rachel Cummings, and India Day, Omega Garg, Gadam Kamath, Ilya Rajenstein, Oded Regev, Salil Shram, Noah Stevens Davidowitz, Tomas Vidik, and David Weiss. Um, but with that, and without uh, further ado, I'll uh, pass it on to Christos. Please take it away. Uh, great. Uh, thank you, Eric, for the introduction, and thank uh, all the organizers of TCS Plus. It's a great initiative, and I'm glad to be invited. Uh, yeah, you can all hear me, right? Awesome. Uh, great. So, so yeah, I'm Chris Ozamos. I'm uh, uh, University of Athens and UW Madison. And I will talk to you today about the joint work I have with uh, my colleague Elias Diagonicolas at UW Madison and uh, Daniel Kane, who is at uh, UC San Diego. And uh, this is uh, 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 like a new work that is uh, scheduled to appear in. Uh, uh, stock 23. So I will talk to you today about uh, this concept of uh, uh, getting strongly polynomial algorithms for approximate uh, uh, Forster transforms. I will explain what Forster transforms are. And uh, we'll see a main application, which was also uh, uh, a large, at large uh, the main motivation of this work, which is uh, to learning uh, half spaces and uh, learning theory. Okay, so uh, but before I start, uh, like uh, as I mentioned, uh, feel free to ask me questions at any point during the talk. Uh, this is meant to be interactive, and uh, that's why you're all here. It's better than like uh, seeing a recording later on. Take uh, advantage of this, and uh, yeah, please ask uh, please ask questions. Okay. So yeah, let me start. So let me before I explain what the Forster transform is, this uh, concept in the title. Let me say first uh, that we're interested in normalizing uh, point data sets. So we have a data set containing a large number of points and we want to appropriately normalize it. Uh, we'll see what this means. Uh, and th this is an important process for many machine learning methods and optimization methods as uh, like uh, many of the optimization algorithms require uh, uh, like some kind of smoothness and some kind of uh, nice proper, nice guarantees about your uh, data set. And uh, to uh, consider a con concrete example, let's assume you have n uh, points, a data set of n points that are all um, in uh, D dimensions in R to the D. And uh, what are some uh, common normalization methods? First off, uh, one thing you can do is you can uh, like normalize the magnitude of all points. You can rescale every point so that its uh, norm is equal to one. So this, uh, I don't know if you can see this, but I have some a collection of points here, which is uh, like in two dimensions. And if I normalize it to be, uh, to have norm one, this becomes uh, projected to the, um, uh, to the unit sphere. To this circle in two dimensions. Another operation I can do is uh, I can um, uh, apply, can multiply every point by a matrix A. This is a linear of transformation of my space. And this ensures that the covariance matrix or the second moment matrix of my points is identity. So in this example, this would be, I have these points which are somewhat stretched in some uh, direction and I normalize it so that they are more like spherical. Okay, so these are two common operations one can apply 
uh, in the data set. Now, what the Forster transform uh, uh, aims to do is it aims to achieve both of these guarantees simultaneously. Okay. So in particular, this means that uh, Forster transform uh, aims to bring points in what's called the radial isotropic position, meaning that uh, we want to map the points into a new data set, X, X prime, where every point has unit norm. And uh, at the same time, the second moment matrix is uh, spherical. So it is uh, identity rescaled by one over D. Okay, so if I take in the new data set, the expectation of X, X transpose, uh, this is one over N, the sum of all the points, X, X transpose, this should be uh, one over D times the identity. Okay, so these were the two the two common operations before, but I want to achieve them both at the same time. And uh, uh, I might not be able to achieve them perfectly. So we want to consider what's called the epsilon approximate uh, Forster transform. If I, I'll call this uh, epsilon approximate, if this uh, second moment matrix is approximately equal to the uh, identity. So it's one minus epsilon over D and uh, one bounded between one minus epsilon over D and one plus epsilon over D. So essentially all the eigenvalues will be bounded by this. Okay, so far. Uh, yes, okay. I have a question. Uh, oh, is yes. there, what is the constraint of how the new points relate to the old points? Awesome, yeah, so that's what I'm uh, gonna get to now. So, uh, so what am I allowed to do to transform them? So I'm allowed to do two operations. I can take any single point in my data set and rescale it by a constant. Okay, so I can multiply this by five. So it increase the magnitude essentially. And uh, can also apply uh, uh, the same transformation matrix, like a linear transformation and multiply all the points by the same uh, matrix A. Okay. And uh, note that uh, the order in which I'm doing these operations doesn't really matter. Since uh, for any X, for any point in my data set, if I apply C1, then multiply by A1, then C2, A2, C3, A3, the X. So this I can always group into something which is C times A dot X, where C is all the constants and A is all the, um, the product of all the matrices. Okay. And moreover, I can even set, uh, since I, I uh, know that I want all the norms uh, to be one, uh, after this operation, I can even uh, force this uh, C to be one over the norm of A dot X. Okay, so really uh, what I'm trying to find is uh, one matrix, one invertible matrix A, so that if uh, I map X to A, dot A times X and then uh, normalize it to have norm one, then all the points are in a uh, radial isotropic position, as I said before. Okay, and uh, look on the right hand side, I have uh, a picture of what this does. If I start with this data set, it, uh, so this is somehow, you have some points that are very uh, close together and one point that's very far apart. So applying this operation, I can make it to something that looks like uh, the bottom where I spread out the points and somehow they, I don't have such uh, tiny distances anymore. And uh, so the points are more evenly spread out. So this is what the force to transform aims to do. It's clear? Okay. So what's nice about uh, this uh, force to transforms is that uh, Forster's theorem tells us that uh, such a force to transform always exists as long as points are in general position, meaning uh, that uh, uh, essentially, uh, no, uh, like uh, the uh, the points are uh, linearly dependent. Okay, so if points are in general position, the Forster's theorem tells us that you can always bring any uh, point set into radial isotropic position using these operations. Like uh, a Forster transform may not always exist and uh, if uh, points are not in general position. 
So for example, if 90% of the points are lie on a one dimensional subspace, then no matter how you multiply the points, this will always be the case. So you will still have all the points lying on a one dimensional subspace. And uh, these uh, you can see with some simple calculations that you can never uh, make it uh, be radial isotropic. Okay. And uh, in fact, uh, a theorem by Hopkins, Kane, uh, Lovett, and uh, Mahazan in uh, 2020 says that gives the uh, a characterization of when Forrester transform exists. And they show that uh, Forrester transform exists unless there's a k dimensional subspace containing at least k over d fraction of the points. So in all, in all the other cases exist unless there's what's called a heavy subspace, a subspace containing uh, more points than it should. Okay. So uh, for those of you that are uh, uh, familiar with uh, the problem of matrix scaling, uh, it's uh, the it's a nice it's a uh, there's a nice analogy to that to that problem. So what is matrix scaling? So in matrix scaling, you're uh, are also given a, you're given a matrix A with uh, positive entries, and you want to transform it into another one by multiplying each row and column by a constant. Uh, and you want to transform it to one where the row sums are all equal and the column sums are all equal. So you want to uh, somehow rescale the matrix so that uh, uh, all the row sums and all the column sums are equal. Okay. And there's a nice analogy in the uh, force to transform. The goal is uh, to make the norm of all the points equal and the variance in every direction equal. Well, in matrix scaling, the goal is to make the row sums are equal and the column sums are equal. And in both problems, you have two operations. Either rescale, uh, uh, force to transform, rescale a single point by a constant or multiply all points by the same matrix A. In the matrix scaling, you have two operations, multiplying a row or multiplying a column. And uh, uh, there is a, always a nice existence theorem. In uh, one case, it's Forster's theorem. In uh, matrix scaling, is uh, Sinkhorn's uh, theorem. And uh, what's uh, common in both problems, uh, you have these uh, two, two goals that you have to achieve at the same time. It is uh, easy, uh, like uh, quite easy to achieve either of them uh, separately but achieving them both simultaneously is uh, quite challenging. Okay, for example, in matrix scaling, it's always simple to divide all the rows by the sum of the, of the row, but achieving uh, all the row sums and both the row sums and column sums to be equal, it's uh, harder. Okay, so similar in uh, when you're trying to compute the uh, Forster transforms, uh, bringing points in radial isotropic position, uh, is uh, significantly computationally intensive. It's not as simple as bringing them to isotropic position or to just uh, uh, rescaling them so that they're all norm one. There are several algorithms that uh, attempt to solve this problem. And uh, they, uh, they are iterative algorithms that uh, build on a convex program formulation by Bark in 98. For example, Hardin Moitra uh, gave one, Arstein, Avidan, Kaplan, and Sarid gave another one. And uh, there is also, uh, we also presented uh, a different approach in prior work uh, where we saw the uh, simple explicit semi definite program that can be used to uh, obtain Forster transforms and obtain nice guarantees. And so there are all these approaches. But what's common uh, in all of them is that these methods are weakly polynomial. Uh, if for them to work, they typically require some niceness properties of uh, your point set, uh, which are implied, uh, which are guaranteed when you have uh, bounded bit complexity. So they all assume that essentially uh, the bit complexity of the points is bounded in some sense. And they do not uh, they can they do not apply for arbitrary point sets. Okay, so in this work, what we aim to find uh, we aim to 
uh, bypass this uh, difficulty and design what's called the strongly polynomial algorithms. So what are strongly polynomial algorithms? So the concept of uh, strongly polynomial time was introduced by Megiddo in 83. And it says that uh, an algorithm that uh, takes as input n numbers of b bits is uh, strongly polynomial if and only if it satisfies three conditions. First, it uh, must use only elementary arithmetic operations. In particular, just the addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Only basic operations are allowed. Uh, and uh, the number of arithmetic operations that it does must only depend on the number, must be polynomial in the number of uh, different numbers given in the input and not on uh, their bit complexity. So it must apply uh, no matter how complex the numbers are, okay, how, how many, what's the precision of the numbers. And, uh, but uh, at the same time, it has uh, this, uh, uh, like a more strange uh, requirement that any number that appears in intermediate computation must be rational, but and its bit complexity must be a polynomial in N and B. It must not explode the bit complexity of the points. And uh, because uh, otherwise it, it couldn't even be simulated, but it wouldn't even be polynomial time. Okay. So once you have these requirements, uh, yeah, these algorithms are called uh, strongly polynomial. And the uh, most uh, classic algorithmic problems that we have uh, ad admit uh, strongly polynomial time algorithms. Searching, sorting, uh, sort of computing sort of paths or network flows, all of them uh, can be solved in strongly polynomial time. Now, uh, like more complex tasks like uh, uh, linear programming, uh, we, we do not know whether strongly polynomial time algorithms exist. And in fact, it is one of the major open problems in computer science, whether one can come up with a, a, a process that essentially only does polynomial uh, uh, in the polynomial number of steps in the description, in the number of constraints essentially uh, of, the, of your LP. And the which does not depend on the bit complexity of your input. For example, like uh, uh, the ellipsoid method or uh, is polynomial time, but its running time depends on uh, the bit complexity of uh, uh, the numbers in your LP formulation. So what's uh, 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 our main result? What we present the first algorithm that can compute uh, Forster transforms in strongly polynomial time. Uh, what we saw is that there is an algorithm running in time strongly polynomial in ND uh, uh, over epsilon that computes an epsilon approximate Forster transform when one exists. Otherwise, it correctly identifies a K dimensional subspace containing K over D fraction of the points. So we said that uh, force the transform may not always exist. So if it, uh, force the transform doesn't exist, our algorithm is able to detect it and provide the witness that it doesn't exist. It tells you here's a subspace that is heavy, contains a large fraction of the points. Otherwise, it succeeds in finding an approximate force the transform. I think that's water. Any questions so far? Well, Christos, maybe you can say a bit about how the uh, weekly polynomial time algorithms work. Uh, right. So essentially, uh, weekly, these weekly polynomial time algorithms, they define an objective function. And essentially, uh, yeah, there are many different uh, processes. So essentially, they're trying to optimize it uh, by running uh, a process like gradient descent, or uh, and uh, uh, essentially like uh, 
the precision, like uh, uh, in order for them to be successful, they require some um, some properties about your original point set. Okay, I see. so but will the alternating updates do anything at all? Oh. Uh, sure, yeah. So alternating updates is another variant, but it can also take a lot, uh, a long time to convert, similar to uh, similar to the matrix scaling problem. Like alter alternating updates in matrix scaling uh, is a good heuristic, but it's might be very slow. Okay. So yeah, as Elias points out in the chat, uh, like in a so one verse one approach is to define this convex objective. Another approach was, uh, that uh, we proposed in prior work was uh, like uh, just specifying an explicit uh, semi-definite program, and uh, like uh, solving it gives you the answer directly. Okay, but the solving, for example, like uh, LPs is uh, we do not know how to get strongly polynomial let alone uh, SDPs, which is even impossible for several cases. Okay, because uh, the solutions may not even be uh, uh, rational. Okay, so I'll, uh, before I go to the proof sketch and details of how this theorem works and how this algorithm, which will be more uh, uh, illustrative of what we do, uh, let me move on to our main application, which was also the main motivation of this work. So our main application is uh, in the pack learning half spaces. So what's pack learning half spaces? We assume there is a distribution D over labeled points in RD, and every point X has a label Y that corresponds to uh, an, un on an unknown half space with a normal W star. So this means that the label Y is given by the sign of w star dot x, like in the picture below, like all the points above uh, w star are labeled positive, otherwise they're labeled negative. And the goal is to learn a classifier that uh, with high probability is able to predict uh, the label of every, uh, of a new point from the distribution quite accurately. Uh, it makes uh, only epsilon fraction of the time mistake. Okay, so that's the standard problem of pack learning half spaces. And this is one of the most uh, fundamental problems in machine learning. It dates back to uh, 58, to the work of Rosenblatt, uh, who gave the perceptron algorithm, the first algorithm for finding uh, linear separators uh, and solving this problem. And uh, in this algorithm, uh, this algorithm I was able to, is able to find uh, good separator, assuming that uh, uh, in the optimal W star, uh, there is a margin, meaning that the closest point to the uh, half space to the hyperplane W star uh, is at least a distance uh, uh, gamma. So the number of iterations depends on this distance and it's bounded by one over gamma squared. Okay, so in linear programming, the ellipsoid is uh, able to do this faster and can find a perfect linear separator in uh, logarithmically in this uh, margin. So there are some polynomial in D factors that I'm omitting, but uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, the, the dependence of this parameter gamma is uh, logarithmically in one over gamma. And uh, this is, it's simple to formulate this problem as a linear program. You just uh, specify, you want to identify a vector W that for all samples, uh, the, la the label Y times W dot X must be positive. Okay. So we can solve this via linear programming, yet uh, the running time of linear programming is weakly polynomial. In particular, this dependence of, there is a dependence of gamma, uh, which is a strange parameter there, right? Like why, why do we even need this? So this margin gamma determines the runtime of the algorithm. And it's, uh, we can also bound to what gamma is if the bit complexity is bounded also. Okay, so these algorithms require are weakly polynomial because they depend on how 
points are structured in, uh, are placed in space. And uh, the, the major problem we mentioned is whether strongly polynomial algorithms exist for linear programming. And uh, th such algorithms are only known for very restricted uh, cases. So we do not know such a strongly polynomial time algorithm in general. So now coming back to our problem, uh, okay, we, we see that uh, so like uh, solving the problem of learning half spaces via linear programming is challenging. It corresponds to this main open uh, problem, but can we achieve something? Can we uh, do this? Can we uh, uh, do this for our problem? Uh, what's hard about this is that if you try to do proper learning, like uh, essentially try to find a classifier that is itself a half space, you, I, I, I find the vector W such that your prediction also corresponds to sine of W in the text. This is uh, uh, essentially as hard as solving general LPs, linear, linear programs, okay? So uh, essentially you're stuck in this barrier that you, in order to learn uh, half spaces, you must uh, provide strongly polynomial algorithms for linear programs. Yet this is not, uh, 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 and this, uh, we thought that this was impossible because of this reason. But uh, in fact, what turns out is that you can bypass this uh, difficulty if you um, um, work with improper learning. So what is improper learning? If you output a hypothesis that is not restricted to be a half space, it can be something different, but uh, performs at least as well as the half space, as a half space. Okay, and the main uh, result that we saw is that there is an algorithm running a strongly polynomial uh, uh, time in uh, D over epsilon that is, computes a hypothesis so that with high probability uh, it uh, makes error at most epsilon on epsilon fraction of the points. And in particular, the hypothesis output is not a half space, but we'll see it's a collection of different half spaces that span the space appropriately. Okay, so how can we achieve this result? So we know that uh, there, um, there are two operations that do not affect the problem of learning half spaces. You can, if you have such, uh, something like uh, on the right hand side, points uh, uh, separated by uh, a hyperplane. Now rescaling any, any point by a positive constant doesn't change its sign. Moreover, stretching the space by applying uh, the same linear transformation to all the points uh, continues making it like, uh, uh, continues satis to satisfy the linear separability assumption. So in particular, even if we apply a force transform to all the points initially, they will still remain separable. And we will be able to identify what's the correct rule in the original points. Okay. So that's the main idea. We can use Forster transforms to uh, as a pre-processing step in these uh, uh, in learning half spaces. And the second idea is uh, we saw that this concept of um, the margin that most algorithms like perceptron or linear programming depended on this uh, parameter, the margin, which is essentially if you have margin gamma, you need uh, all points. Uh, to be further away than gamma from the target hyperplane. Instead, we relax this concept to what's called the soft margin, where we only require that a non-trivial fraction of the points are further than the margin. We do not want every point to be far away. At least it suffices for our purposes to have a non-trivial fraction of the points further than it. So, and what's nice is that if we, First, bring our points to radial isotropic position through a force to transform. We indeed get soft margin uh, for any unit vector, not only for the target uh, hyperplane. Any direction we look at has uh, 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 points far away, farther than one over root uh, uh, d essentially. And why is that? Since uh, any point has a norm at most one, and for any unit vector, 
we have that the expectation of V dot X squared is equal to one over D by the assumptions of the radial isotropic position. This means that we must have at least uh, one over D and one over two D points. The, to have uh, uh, V dot X squared, at least one over two D. This is a, a somewhat uh, an application of Markov's inequality, essentially. So this means that, uh, like, if I look at uh, points that have uh, v dot x at least one over two, uh, one over root two d, then I have a significant number of them, a one over two d fraction, that are further away. Okay. So now, what can we do? It turns out that uh, you can modify the perceptron algorithm. Not only to take to make one over gamma squared uh, uh, iterations, but uh, until it perfectly separates all the points, but you can modify it uh, to find uh, a vector that labels all the points correctly outside a given margin. So you can specify your, the margin yourself. And uh, the modified perceptron by Danagan Vempala uh, does uh, uh, a bounded number of iterations and guarantees that after this number of iterations, uh, all the points outside the margin will be correctly labeled as in the picture uh, that I saw, right? So they all like uh, this, I, I'll find the direction V that everything outside the margin is correctly uh, classified. Now, because the points are in radial isotropic position, if I run this uh, with a margin one over uh, root two D, it means that not only I get something out, uh, that the number of points outside the margin is uh, at least one over two D fraction of all the points. So it's a non-trivial fraction of the points that I have. So what, uh, what I can do is I can use the classifier that the modified perceptron gave me to classify just the points that are far away from the margin far away from the target, uh, from the from V. Okay, and then, so essentially I, I, class, I use V to classify all the points that are outside this gray area. And then I repeat the process in this gray area. I again, apply the force to transform on the points inside this gray area, and then run the modified perceptron again. So I do this iteratively and we, after uh, D log one over epsilon iterations, it turns out that the space has shrunk so much that there's only epsilon mass left uh, that's unclassified with that, that I can completely ignore. That's a, we had used a similar analysis in our uh, new RIPS paper in uh, uh, 2019. So this is a technique uh, that's uh, like a layering technique that you classify only parts of the space and you recurse uh, and to improve your classifier. Okay. So uh, this is, you see how uh, this process and using force to transform strong in, uh, uh, can let you build this classifier and all the steps are running strongly polynomial time because we directly use a strongly polynomial time force to transform algorithm. Okay. Yeah. And uh, not only can we learn in case, the cases where there is a perfect linear separator, a perfect uh, half space? We can also learn when the half space has errors. So we can obtain strongly polynomial time algorithms, even when the labels are noisy. And we consider a version of a noise uh, called the Massard noise, where the label of every point is split with probability at most eta. And uh, uh, in, uh, for this problem, there has been a significant uh, recent progress in obtaining efficient algorithms that uh, can learn under, uh, under noise. And uh, in fact, our prior work uh, with uh, uh, Elias and Daniel uses this idea of force to transform to efficiently learn half spaces with Massar nodes. And in fact, all the steps of, our, of this algorithm are uh, strongly polynomial, apart from the part, uh, the part that we were missing, uh, the, 
we didn't know how to compute the Forster transform uh, efficiently in strongly polynomial time. Now, by directly plugging in our uh, algorithm, we obtain a strongly polynomial time learner for half spaces under Massar nodes. Okay. So I pause here a bit for questions. This concludes the application part of my talk. And then I'll move on to uh, an overview of how our Forster uh, uh, transform algorithm works. Uh, Christos, yeah, can you say something about like why it's obvious that this like recursive procedure wouldn't like overfit or would actually be correct in the PAC model? Uh, right. Essentially, so the, the problem you mentioned is that what if uh, I end up with too many half spaces essentially? Right, uh, that, uh, uh, but the idea is that since we get a bounded constant fraction, like classify right. a, a bounded constant fraction of the points, this uh, uh, wouldn't overfit. So essentially, you uh, like in the first so you step, get you some can... like log. Well, how many half spaces do you end up having? Is it like d log? Yeah, yeah. So, so essentially, right. So if you have n points, you would get a d log n. Uh, half spaces, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. So you not get something that's linear. So the description complexity is uh, uh, you get uh, log, uh, log to the number of points. So essentially this increases your sample complexity only by some uh, like polylogarithmic factors, essentially. It doesn't, uh, okay. mm -hmm. right? Because you end up not having to learn that many uh, half spaces in the end. And just for uh, to recall, the, the algorithm really is then recursive. So on a new sample, it's sort of uh, you try the first uh, linear classifier. If you're in like the uncertainty band, you go to the next one. Yeah, you get uh, to the next one. Right. So this, this is a, a list of classifiers with a, a certain region of uh, like. Right. Of power. And, it, and it's or, you really need to go in order one by one. You go in order one by one. So there's another mm -hmm. algorithm you could do that there are multiple ways to obtain this result. Uh, there's another algorithm via boosting that you could do essentially, mm -hmm. like use multiple, use multiple classifiers and do a majority vote that would still give you the same type of result. You don't that you do not go in order, but yeah. So these are similar. I think I think this is. Oh, similar. I see. I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, so let me proceed to how our uh, Forrester transform algorithm works. And uh, first, uh, let me uh, like remind you what Forrester transform aims to do. Okay, so what we want is we want to take a point x and we want to multiply it by a uh, by matrix A and then rescale it to have unit norm. So that's uh, the operation F A of x. Okay, and then we want that if I uh, compute now the second moment matrix, this is approximately one over D times the identity. Okay, so in, uh, I compute the second moment matrix of the transformed points of FA of X. Okay, so how do we analyze? So uh, the key part of our algorithm is defining a potential function or a loss function like in machine learning. Um, so we define the, a potential function that uh, we constantly improve as uh, our uh, algorithm progresses. So then this function is the squared Frobenius norm of the second moment matrix in our current uh, uh, transformation. So the, what is that? This is just the sum of the, uh, of the squares of all the entries of our matrix. And the, what's nice about this function is that this is upper bounded by one. You can show that if I if you take the square uh, the squares of all the entries of this uh, second moment matrix, this will always be upper bounded by one, and uh, will achieve its minimum value of one over d when uh, you uh, solve the problem exactly. So when you uh, your second moment matrix is actually one over d times the identity. 
Okay. So now, moreover, if you want uh, an epsilon approximate uh, uh, Forster transform, you only need to um, get uh, this potential function to be something like one over d plus epsilon squared over d squared. Okay, so what's uh, nice so far is there's no like uh, bit complexity or anything. So we define a well-defined potential and we want to improve. And uh, our algorithm, what it tries to do is it's iterative and aims to reduce the potential significantly at every step. Okay, so at every step it implies a transformation. It might not be very close to, ide to be identity, but then it iteratively improves on that. And note that uh, this transformation composes. So if I uh, first uh, transform the points and then transform them again, it's the same as uh, applying the product of the two matrices uh, on the original point set. So a good way to think of this is that at every step we uh, leave the points at some uh, at some place and then try to improve them again. All right. So now let me give you like a picture of how this algorithm works. First of all, what it does, uh, what, what the potential function does. So you see that I have this uh, GIF here where it starts with a large potential. I don't know if it's too fast and you can see this. And then as it stretches out the points, you can see that the potential function decreases until it reaches like this 0 0.5 because one over two, which is in two dimensions. And this is a, like a perfect, uh, like forcer transfer. Okay, and you see how uh, these uh, get uh, like uh, like uh, spread out. With uh, thinking back to our uh, half space application, you see that now these margins and everything are uh, much nicer, and that's what because the points are more spread out, spread apart. Okay, so uh, first of all, to, uh, there is a, um, a simple way to improve this uh, uh, potential function, this loss function. Uh, one uh, particular way is to, uh, to know that if the points are not in epsilon isotropic position, radial isotropic position, then it must be that uh, some eigenvalues are off. They're not close to one over D. So there must be some reasonably sized eigenvalue gap. So this means that I can partition the eigenvalues into two sets, two subspaces, the eigenvectors essentially in two subspaces. Those that have uh, uh, large eigenvalues and those that have small. And uh, so essentially I split my point, my uh, space into two subspaces where the uh, eigenvalues differ by at least some gap with this poly epsilon over D. So if you look at this picture, essentially there are, uh, uh, these are two eigenvectors of my point set. This uh, V perp is the large space, which has a large eigenvalue 0 0.78, and the V has uh, an eigenvalue of uh, 0 0.22, it's much smaller. So one simple operation that I can do is I can transform my point set by essentially multiplying along the direction V. So I want to increase the eigenvalue uh, at uh, lambda two. I'll multiply everything in that direction and uh, 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 yeah, to rescale my points. So this is done by up multiplying them by this matrix. Okay. So this uh, turns out it's nice and gives a bound improvement as long as all the points are somewhat like spread out, they're not too close to uh, all to the subspaces uh, V or V perp. So that at least if there are some points that are far away, this works. And uh, this is like one uh, way of, to do the improvement. There are multiple other ways. You can do gradient descent. You can do this uh, like alternating updates and so on. So if the, your points are spread out and they're not concentrated in two subspaces, uh, then pretty much everything works to decrease the potential. So the hard case, and really this is the, the contribution, is in the extreme case where all the points are close to either V or V pair. 
Okay. So think of these. So all my points are close to uh, these two subspaces. Okay, and uh, uh, I need a much more complex uh, update that I call the blow up step. So uh, I need to somehow accelerate this process so that I'm not stuck. Okay, so in particular, now instead of rescaling with in the direction V, I'm uh, computing. So what we're doing is we're computing the uh, eigenvectors that correspond to the matrix as if I only had the points, the large points that are in V close to V pair. Okay, so then I'm essentially centering my update to the points in uh, that are close to V perp, and um, instead multiplying by uh, rescaling along the orthogonal direction, which is uh, I'm rescaling across along U. So it's a bit uh, hard to imagine, uh, hard to visualize, but really what I'm doing is I'm uh, adjusting these uh, subspaces V and V perp so that the uh, so that they're somehow more aligned to the big points, to the points that are that lie close to the subspace to the subspace V perp, which is somehow overloaded, and I want to somehow uh, make it lighter. Okay, so let me give you some intuition of what this update does. So imagine you have a cluster of points. So imagine that all your points are actually very close to V perp. And they're really, really close to each other. Essentially, they're indistinguishable. They're really the same point. And there's just another one other point in uh, V. OK, so in order for you to bring them in radial isotropic position, you must really break this, uh, uh, this cluster. You must like apply it in order to get strong polynomial time. You have to really break this. Right? This is a hard nut to crack. So if this is like a, a really like a point where everything is like really concentrated and you must break it apart. So now if you were to do this uh, natural thing of rescaling in this dire v direction, right? Like you wouldn't really do anything to the cluster. You would just move it around. Okay. So if you rescale across the closest direction, like all the points move together because these are this is off-centered. Right, but if you somehow like center your uh, the direction essentially of your uh, uh, of your scaling, so that it's orthogonal to this uh, to this point set, essentially like now this uh, uh, this is the direction u, and uh, this uh, breaks this cluster apart. So this is really what uh, we need to do: this explosion, this blow up step. So that points are more evenly spread out. Okay, now like it might turn out that it's impossible to break these points apart because they are really indeed one point, and that's uh, the only case essentially where force to transform is not possible. So if there are actually just one point and you, this step doesn't work, it's uh, because the force to transform doesn't exist. If it does exist, it will be able to blow them up if they because there's some tiny gap between them. Okay, so this is the idea, the above ideas that I presented, uh, like uh, suffice to give you an iterative algorithm that brings the points in radial stropic position and in number of steps are just polynomial in MD and uh, one over epsilon. Okay, yeah, but these are just, uh, 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 so this is independent of any geometric notions like margin or the bit complexity of the points. So this is like purely the number of points, all the numbers given in the input. The only problem is that uh, this is uh, uh, the number of steps and not the arithmetic operations. Okay, so in order to get a truly strongly polynomial time algorithm, we need two additional ingredients. First of all, like we need to do arithmetic operations. So we need to be able to do uh, identical positions that were required to compute the eigenvectors. Uh, like efficiently in strongly polynomial time, like with just multiplications and additions. And we also need to ensure that in every step, the bit complexity of the numbers remains uh, bounded. Okay. So to do this, 
uh, this turns out to be uh, sufficiently complex. So we uh, we need we needed uh, uh, to run the algorithm sufficiently high accuracy for our eigenvectors and eigenvalues, and that we weren't able to get to find in any like of the available textbooks. So in fact, we designed a novel algorithm for computing uh, the eigendecomposition that runs in strongly polynomial time that indeed has this guarantee and gives us a multiplicative guarantee that we wanted rather than uh, the usual additive guarantees that uh, people that uh, exist in the textbooks. So in particular, we presented uh, uh, this uh, result that where we say that given any positive semi-definite matrix, we are able to compute orthogonal vectors and scalars, such that if I take the, uh, the matrix corresponding to this approximate again decomposition, this uh, M hat of uh, the sum of uh, like AI times uh, QI, QI transpose, then this matrix is essentially spectrally close to my original matrix, like multiplicative. So in any direction, if I project a V uh, with this matrix uh, mu hat, M hat, this is uh, at uh, one minus epsilon close to uh, like one plus minus epsilon close to the uh, to M. Okay, and this algorithm does only uh, poly D over epsilon arithmetic operations on uh, bounded uh, bit complexity numbers. So the algorithm works by uh, combining the power method with the gram smith process. So the algorithm is randomized, that, well, that's what we know. And uh, we, what it does, it, it starts with a random matrix, R, and uh, uh, multiplies M uh, with R uh, T times. So it essentially computes M to the T times R. And then applies uh, the gram smith process to orthogonalize the columns. And this set of orthogonal vectors, uh, we saw that they satisfy indeed the uh, desired uh, guarantees. So this is uh, um, one uh, uh, side result that we uh, got. And uh, another um, part of the process is uh, what we needed, we needed to ensure that uh, the transformation matrices that uh, we obtain are actually bounded, they have bounded bit complexity. And in fact, as you multiply things throughout the process, this bit complexity might increase exponentially. So we needed a way to like uh, keep, it, uh, keep it bounded. So we came up with this uh, process, this rounding process, that uh, shows that if you give me any transformation A that maps uh, points to uh, some uh, to some location to, from X it goes to FA of X, what uh, we can do is uh, we can find a, a different matrix A bar, which has uh, integer entries of uh, bounded bit complexity, pol polynomial in D, log one over epsilon and B, so that, uh, so that the, the mapping is actually really, really close to, what, uh, to where it was. So it only changes the mapping by a distance epsilon. So if it only changes by distance epsilon, the mapping, it really, uh, our potential doesn't change significantly. So, so like really the algorithm works uh, by applying the, this rounding step at the end of every iteration. So really we decrease the potential significantly and then slightly increase it by uh, rounding the matrix. And we decrease the potential significantly, we round the matrix again, we decrease it and so on. So in this way, we maintain the bound bit complexity and everything is uh, strongly polynomial. Okay, so that was uh, the result. So in summary, we gave the first uh, strongly polynomial time algorithm for computing uh, Forster transforms. So there are, uh, as an important corollary of this technique, we obtained the first uh, strongly polynomial time algorithm for pack learning house spaces that uh, 
And somehow this was unintuitive to us because we thought this was impossible because of the connection to linear programming. And in fact, our algorithm works even when uh, the data, the labels of all the points are noisy, under mass are noisy. So there are many interesting open questions from our work. So in all our algorithms, we assume that epsilon to be a constant. Actually, it's not, uh, it's, uh, I think it's impossible to get to be strongly polynomial even in the epsilon parameter. Uh, but one uh, uh, part of our work uh, is that our dependence on epsilon is not something crazy, it's polynomial, but ideally could be uh, polylogarithmic. So an, an open, interesting open question is to improve this dependence on, uh, on epsilon, on the approximate of how accurately you want the force to transform to be. So for our, uh, uh, half, uh, for our half space application, we didn't care about this to be very accurate. Any constant epsilon sufficed. Um, so that was uh, one, this is one question. Another question is whether you can do this identical position result that uh, we gave, also having a polylogarithmic dependence in one over epsilon, and somehow whether you can de-randomize our algorithm. Like, can you make it deterministic? So the whole algorithm that we presented is randomized just for the fact that you can, that we do not know how to compute eigen uh, these eigenspaces. Um, in a deterministic way. So another uh, important question is wh how, whether one can generalize these uh, techniques to solve generalizations of uh, uh, problems that are generalization of force to transform, like operator scaling or tensor scaling. So this is it. So uh, thank you. I'm happy to answer questions. Yeah, so uh, I guess I can ask a question. So um, in terms of the dependence on epsilon, like if, uh, so when you were saying it's impossible, is that in the in the pack learning model, it's impossible to get uh, dependence logarithmic on one over one over epsilon or in, in which uh, way? Oh, oh, I said, uh, no, I've said like to, uh, to completely get rid of the dependence on epsilon. So yeah, so ah. for pack for pack learning, the epsilon, as Elias points out, is not the same as the approximation error uh, here. I'm saying like for Forster transform, like to have an exact Forster transform in strongly polynomial time, like, oh, uh, right. I, like <laughs> this is uh, not possible. Okay, right. so that's so you need some kind of dependence on epsilon, uh, right? So epsilon yes. essentially must. In, uh, for the definition of strongly polynomial must be must not be an input must be something given right so even if you get polylog still this wouldn't be strongly polynomial with respect to epsilon all right so if i uh so let's say there's no i mean like the your distribution let's say is explicitly given right so i i kind of give you all the points that i want to classify uh and you want to use your your approach with the improper classifier. Um, would you need a number of classifiers that depends polynomially on one over epsilon or logarithmically on one over epsilon? Or uh, a the, number of half spaces, would, I guess. It would be logarithmically in one over epsilon. Okay, so that would yes. Right. Okay. So so that's right. that's the epsilon. Yeah. So because uh, every time you're essentially shrinking by a constant factor. If you assume right. the okay. yes, yes, okay. yes, 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 yes. So essentially you're shrinking by constant factor. So you, in order for you to get epsilon fraction, you only log on over it. So that's right. a, a different epsilon from the- Yeah, yeah, okay, good. Yeah, so I'm using the same letter, but- No, no, I understand. Yeah, I was just trying to get that. Yeah. Good. Okay. So as I said, I'll take us off the recording and um, we can uh, stick around and ask any more questions. <laughs>